It's a health care crisis caused in part by mystery pricing. So you ask the hospital system, how much do procedures cost? This is the master price list of UNC Healthcare. They blacked it out. Like other troubled insurance plans, North Carolina's plan is projected to go belly up, but not the powerful hospital industry. Atrium Health CEO received more than $6 million. That just sounds like an incredible amount of money. This week, who's working to keep health costs secret? In the event of a natural disaster or a global pandemic, if China shut the door, the U.S. would have to stand in line with other countries for medicines. Now, as the coronavirus crisis expands, we examine how it threatens the U.S. supply of critical medicines that come from China. Also, days before Super Tuesday, the polls are spinning again. Advice going into this election? The first thing is if a poll disagrees with what you want to see or what you think is happening, don't dismiss it as fake news. And we follow the money as your tax dollars are spent on mascots Owly Skywarn and Sanctuary Sam. There are things we should be spending our dollars on, but not this. The senator who wants to stop it with the Swag Act. Welcome to Full Measure. I'm Cheryl Ackeson. The Trump administration has passed a brand new rule. Starting next year, hospitals will have to finally reveal how much they really charge for medical services we buy. Prices secretly negotiated with insurance companies that make it nearly impossible for us to shop around. Some states are already tackling their own version of price transparency as part of an attempt to cut unmanageable health care costs. They're having mixed success. Today, the North Carolina Project. Accountant Dale Falwell was elected treasurer of North Carolina on the promise of fixing the state's deep health cost crisis. In very simple terms, sort of an overview, what was the idea behind your plan? To get rid of secret contracts, to push the power to the consumer. North Carolina's insurance plan covers 720,000 state workers, families, and retirees. It costs $3 billion a year. 80% of that money comes from taxpayers. The whole plan is projected to go belly up by 2023. Falwell's clear pricing project aimed to save billions by exposing and standardizing the mysterious cost of medical treatments. A state association used TV ads to support it. State Treasurer Dale Falwell's clear pricing project ends hospitals' secret contracts. Dale Falwell's clear pricing project makes health care bills transparent and fair. The big idea for North Carolina was modeled in part after one devised more than 2,000 miles away in Montana, where State Insurance Administrator Marilyn Bartlett, who we spoke with last year, began by noting the wildly different hospital costs for knee replacements. And one came in around $30,000 and the other at $105,000. Huge difference. I just kept asking why, why? Well, the implant was much more expensive. Well, can I see the invoice? Can I see what you paid? No, that's private, you can't see that. Bartlett, a former insurance official, played hardball with insurers and hospitals. She installed a new plan that set the fees Montana hospitals get for each medical service, way less than they'd been charging, but still a healthy profit. Inside of two years, that took Montana's health care plan from a $9 million deficit to a $100 million surplus. North Carolina hoped to duplicate Montana's success. But North Carolina's clear pricing project got bogged down in a murky debate with hospitals rejecting the idea of selling medical services based on consistent published prices. Falwell started out much like Bartlett in Montana with a simple question to one of the state-owned hospital systems. So you ask the hospital system, how much do procedures cost? How much do services cost? Correct. And, and they told you what? And what they sent back from that simple request, this is the master price list of UNC Healthcare. They blacked it out. Every single word was blacked out. What reason did they give for that? 
They said we were not entitled to that because that's proprietary information. The way our health system works, people who pay the bills aren't allowed to see what things really cost. Not the patients, taxpayers, or even the state, which hires an insurance company to negotiate deals with hospitals, doctors, and insurance companies. Falwell's clear pricing project sought to upend that. It would start with the price hospitals and doctors receive for treating patients on Medicare, federal insurance for the elderly. The state offered to pay a set amount, 66 percent above the Medicare rate, for hospitals and doctors that treat state workers. So if Medicare pays $1,000 for a surgery on the elderly, the state would pay $1,660 for the same surgery on North Carolina employees, family, and retirees, much less than the hospitals were getting, but still a healthy profit. But North Carolina's hospitals didn't see it that way. They fought with a multi-million dollar campaign. The state treasurer is floating a risky scheme to cut health care benefits for state employees, teachers, and retirees. Facing opposition and lobbying from the powerful and well-connected hospital industry, Falwell started negotiating. He upped what the clear pricing project would pay hospitals from 66 percent more than Medicare to 77 percent more, then 82 percent more, then 96 percent more. But the hospitals and their professional association held firm. How did it end up? What's sort of the summary of where you are versus where you hoped to be? Where it ended up is that we were negotiating against ourselves. Uh, the, the, this association has never, ever offered a counterproposal to anything that we've done with clear pricing. Stephen Lawler heads up the North Carolina Healthcare Association, representing 130 hospitals and health systems. He says one big reason hospitals need to charge state employees more than what Falwell wanted to pay is to make up for other patients who can't pay their bills. I mean, if we just had hospitals that were committed to taking care of state employees, you know, that, that may work. But every hospital in North Carolina has a moral and legal obligation to take care of everyone. He's asking us to, to pick um, a reimbursement model for state employees that doesn't take care of the rest of North Carolinians that need help. Still, a look at the books shows a lot of hospital money isn't going for poor patients or even medical care. Duke University Health System reported operating profit, $560 million over the last two years. Atrium Health CEO received more than $6 million in compensation last year. And Novance operating profit, $445 million over two years. That just sounds like an incredible amount of money. Like the hospitals aren't really struggling to take care of patients. Yeah, so, so I would say that, you know, to put that in perspective, though, you know, for every dollar that they take in um, from a revenue perspective, once the expenses are paid, I mean, there's somewhere between two cents and 18 cents left at the end of the day. So, you know, they're not going to, you know, kind of, um, you know, to, to line the pockets of individuals. Well, six million dollars in compensation for a CEO is but I, pretty I would good. Say, but every, every hospital in the state, just like every you know, other corporation, has a corporate board. So I, I can tell you that every hospital and health system in the state uses a third party, an outside party, that is not affiliated with the organization, you know, to look at the size, the scope, and the scale of that organization and determine what's fair and reasonable for that individual. For their part, Lawler says hospitals favor a better model called value-based pricing. It's focusing on helping those individuals with chronic problems better manage their problems. It's, it's focused on reducing unnecessary admissions to hospitals. And what it does is it takes, you know, that body of work, and when there are savings, it reinvests those savings, you know, into programs and services, capital, or margin for the managed care companies, it reinvests those dollars so we can kind of create a cycle of good in the future. So how did it all end? Last fall, a handful of small independent hospitals and 25,000 doctors did accept North Carolina's clear pricing project, but none of the big hospital systems. 
still looming is a $32 billion shortfall in future health benefits for retired employees. Has this partial deal that you were able to make with some providers and physicians, has it been enough to make a dent in the projections for what the deficit is going to be, the bills that you needed to pay in the future? It's, it's probably not going to make a dent, but it doesn't mean it's not, we're not doing the right thing and going in the right direction. Falwell's new big idea is bundling, paying one negotiated price for surgery, hospital stay, rehab, and office visits. As for that Trump administration initiative forcing hospitals to disclose their secret rates starting next year, hospital groups are suing to stop it, saying it violates the First Amendment. Ahead on Full Measure, your tax dollars spent on goofy gimmicks. We follow the money. But first, how the coronavirus could impact our medicine supply here. You already know that China's coronavirus is spreading and has sparked global panic among some. But there's another impact you may not have heard much about, a threat to our supplies of medicine here in the U.S. This very scenario was foreshadowed two years ago when we spoke with Rosemary Gibson, author of China Rx, exposing the risks of America's dependence on China for medicine. Gibson is back with us today for a medical follow-up. A China RX exposes how dependent we are as a country on China for so many of the ingredients and thousands and thousands of the medicines we take every single day. We're so dependent that if China shut the door on exports to our country, within months our pharmacy shelves would be going bare. So with the coronavirus crisis, is China withholding medicine and medical products from us? China is withholding masks and other protective gear that are made in China, sometimes by U.S. companies, meant for export here. And that's because they have a lot of sick people and they need those products there. And most countries would do the exact same thing. The problem is China had a whole plan and strategy to become the global supplier. But if you become the global supplier, you have responsibility to the rest of the world. You just can't abandon the rest of the world. What about medicine, not masks, but are there medicines that you think are in short supply or going to be in short supply soon? There have been no official reports of the Chinese government withholding medicines to the U.S. and other countries, but it would seem that they would be likely doing that. Your book seemed to predict a scenario like this. It did predict it, unfortunately. It said that in the event of a natural disaster or a global pandemic, if China shut the door, the U.S. would have to stand in line with other countries for medicines and the components to make them. How much medicine that we rely upon comes from China? Well, 85 percent of the strategic national stockpile, which is the medicines and supplies that we need as a country in the event of an outbreak in a city or a hurricane, 85 percent of those products depend to some degree on China. After this crisis is over, will the United States change its systems and its reliance on China? It depends how bad it is. If this coronavirus outbreak goes on in China and hits the U.S. hard, we may see some change to bring some of that manufacturing and self-sufficiency back home. Which you recommend? We have to do it, because someday it's going to hit the fan. This past week, the Food and Drug Administration said it had contacted 180 drug makers, asking them to evaluate their supply chain and identified 20 drugs that are only made in China and nowhere else. However, the FDA told Full Measure the public does not have the right to know the names of the companies or the drugs. Coming up on Full Measure, as Super Tuesday approaches, we get a reality check on those polls. When it comes to the 2016 polls, a lot of people say they were correct because Hillary Clinton did win the popular vote. It's just that pesky little detail that Trump came out ahead in the vote that matters, the electoral count. What's the takeaway as we dive into the heart of 2020? We get a reality check from pollster Scott Rasmussen. President Trump reached the highest popularity marks of his presidency, smack dab in the middle of his Senate impeachment trial. We have the highest poll numbers that we have ever had. Thank you, Nancy, very much. Thank you. 
proving that both polls and public opinion can be unpredictable things. That something polling expert Scott Rasmussen has known for a long time as the 2016 election drove home. What was happening was the data was showing the race was close, but pundits, people talking about the race, political professionals were saying, there's no way Donald Trump can win. I actually sat in the, the green room at Fox on the morning of the election, and people were saying, um, well, the polls show Hillary up by three. There's a margin of error, so she's going to win by six. And one person said, oh, no, it's going to be even bigger than that. The polls are off. She's going to approach double digits. I mean, there was this mindset uh, that was not, not from the data. It was from the eyes of the people who were looking at the data. When a news organization or company commissions a poll, do they get to decide what questions are asked and what the headline is? Because sometimes the headline they pick, which was usually that Trump was doing poorly in some area, if you dug in, there were really signals that showed the opposite in some instances, but not, were not headlined. Right. So obviously the, the organization paying for the poll can use it however they want. They can select the questions. They can interpret it as they want. Sometimes there's a really funny dynamic where the president's job approval will go up, and yet on every question that the, poll, the company asked, it shows that people disagree with the president. Well, what that tells you is they're asking the wrong questions. It seems like the polls are all thrown out there, and even when there's difference among polls, people decide to dismiss the polls or actually disparage polls if they don't have the findings they like. Look, people like things that they agree with. So if you find one poll out of 100 that says your candidate is going to win, you're going to say, this is the greatest poll of all time. And if you find one poll out of 100, or if you find 99 out of 100 that disagree, you're going to say they're all wrong. Uh, that is part of the human nature. I just thought it was interesting looking back. Remember, Hillary Clinton went from measuring the drapes in the Oval Office to canceling or dialing back on her celebration plans right before the election. Right. And yet Donald Trump, he seemed resigned to the fact or that he thought he was going to lose. What does that tell you about their respective internal polling and what it might have been showing? It also shows that even campaigns, maybe especially campaigns, are subject to sw being swept away by the conventional wisdom. Uh, the Trump campaign certainly was. And I think these campaigns, as they watched the process, they had a sense that it might be a little closer than the public was being led to believe. but. Um, it was not, nobody f f on the campaign side really was prepared for the idea that this was going to be the upset of the century. And I advice going into this election, if people are asking you, you know, what should I believe and what should I do? The first thing is if a poll disagrees with what you want to see or what you think is happening, don't dismiss it as fake news. Uh, it is really important for people to look at polling data and see what they can learn from it. You take polls collectively to see where the averages are heading, um, and then you apply a little bit of skeptical assessment to all of it. By the way, a recent NPR poll says voters think the number one threat to our elections by far is misinformation, beating out foreign interference, fraud, and suppression. Next on Full Measure, do we really need Sammy Soil and Milkshake the Cow? One senator follows the money spent on gimmicks. And follow the money, gimmicky spending by federal agencies to promote themselves seems to have taken on some new twists and turns. Your tax money is being spent on mascots Owly Skywarn and Sanctuary Sam, representing the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And they aren't the only ones. Four different programs of the Department of Agriculture each have their own mascot. The Natural Resources Conservation Service has Sammy Soil, the Agriculture Marketing Service uses Milkshake the Cow, Power Panther represents the Food and Nutrition Service, and Thermi and Back get paraded out by the Food Safety and Inspection Service. In Thermi's big smile, you will see 160 degrees Fahrenheit, and that means it's safe to bite when the temperature is right. Do we really need a physical mascot out there, you know, going to uh, parades or what? I don't think that's appropriate. 
Senator Joni Ernst has introduced new legislation to try to end taxpayer-funded projects used for federal propaganda. She tabulated the cost of custom-made costumes. Overall on mascots, the federal government has spent over $250,000, a quarter of a million dollars on mascots. There are things we should be spending our dollars on, but not this. These mascots aren't memorable. People don't know who they are, uh, what they're trying to teach us. They don't care about them, and yet we continue to spend money on them. Other promotional efforts using your tax money. We've identified the perpetrators as difficult to kill, flesh-eating zombies. The CDC produced a zombie preparedness campaign, including this $10,000 comic book and warning videos. Your mission, if you choose to accept it, is to ensure your community is prepared for a zombie apocalypse. Ernst says federal agencies also spend your money on lots of giveaways. $605,000 for coloring books, $60,000 on keychains, $33,000 for Snuggie blankets, $17,000 for koozies to keep your drinks cold, and $16,000 for fidget spinners. A lot of gadgets, a lot of waste, a lot of dollars just wrapped up in little gimmicks. Ernst's proposal is called the SWAG Act. The federal government has what I call mission creep, and we start to spend dollars on things that aren't really our mission as a federal government. And we have gone through this year after year after year. An agency will develop a mascot. Nobody pays attention. The next agency will do that. They'll start spending dollars in areas they shouldn't be spending dollars. It's OK for one agency, so the next gets away with it. We've got to stop that. We've got to stop the wasteful spending. Among other things, the SWAG Act would require federal agencies to disclose how much they spend on advertising and PR. There you go. Next week on Full Measure, we begin our sixth season in the saddle with a no-spin trip to America's southern border with Mexico. The horses can get us to areas where we can't go, uh, not even on, on ATVs. We investigate the status of illegal drug smuggling. This vehicle here was uh, intercepted in our pre-primary area. And when uh, they peered into that, they were able to see uh, packages. Turns out there were the packages contained meth methamphetamine. Plus, we'll find out how the coronavirus shutdowns and border wall construction have impacted mass illegal entries. That's next week on Full Measure. Until then, thanks for watching. We'll be searching for more stories that hold powers accountable.